Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Digital and Social Media Sports Podcast. I am your host, Neil Horowitz. You can find me on Twitter at NJH287, uh, also on LinkedIn, where I post more content. Visit the website, dsmsports.net, for more episodes of content. And of course, uh, check out the podcast, subscribe, all that good stuff on your preferred podcast platform. What a wonderful show for you guys today. Um, This might go down as one of my favorite guests of all time. Someone who is a rock star in the space, and she spits tons of good knowledge on today's episode. You're going to hear from Erin Hodges. She is the digital communications manager for the Colorado Rockies. So stick around for that interview with Erin because you're going to love it. And I want to emphasize a few points that Erin makes because really uh, she gives a ton of great insight into building a brand, using social media strategically in her time with the Rays and the Rockies, among other stops along the way. Uh, But we also talk a lot about career growth and career development. And she makes a lot of just great insights that I want to make sure you don't miss and pay attention to as uh, Aaron and I talk. Uh, first off, you'll see that from day one, she was all about adding skills and experience. You know, you talk about working in sports and the first job may not be in sports. The next job may not be in sports. Uh, it's all about what skill sets are you adding along the way, whether that's digital marketing, social media marketing, partnerships, p- public relations, uh, creative skills and design skills. You know, working in sports does not mean you have to work in sports to every single job. Uh, you can add skills and experience to help you get there along the way. And a great way to understand what those skills are, especially when you're younger in your career, is to look at job descriptions. Look up that job that you want next year. Look up the job that you want 10 years from now and see what kind of skills and experiences do they expect their candidates to have. That is your cheat sheet, as we will talk about in the interview with Aaron to what skills you should be working on and refining. It's great to to be able to have that as a a, a tool as you develop your career. Also, as you hear from Aaron, don't be afraid to hear no. You're going to get a lot of no's, uh, especially in the sports space, really in any space. The sports space is so competitive, so don't be afraid to hear no. You're not going to – you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, you know, as Wayne Gretzky, of course, is uh, is famous for kind of saying, or at least his dad did. Uh, And also, uh, along those same lines, as Aaron will uh, will emphasize – don't be afraid to suck at something. You're you're not going to be an expert the first time you try new things. And you're going to have to pick up new skills, especially if you're in the social media space. As you'll hear, as new content forms come about, you know you can't just uh, delegate everything and allocate everything. You don't have a ton of resources and a ton of time. So you have to learn new things, and you're not gonna, you can't be afraid to suck at things when you first learn them. It's going to take time. So that is another great one. And then lastly, uh, relationships. You know, this is so important. Um, it's not networking, as you'll hear Aaron say, is not about transactions. It's about really creating relationships that you know people that I've been able to grow up with in the space, people that I've uh, you know be able to help mentor along the way in some capacity, people that have mentored me in some capacity. So you know, create relationships, genuine friendships. Um, there's a lot we can learn from each other, a lot we can help each other out, and ultimately, just great friendships can form. Then we can kind of go through this crazy mess, uh, crazy social media sports space together. So. That's a little opening thought, but stick around because this interview is so, so good with Aaron Hodges of the Colorado Rockies. Back with today's guest, and I am so excited to be talking to her. I've told her it's been a long time coming, and we now have a chance to connect. I'm going to pick her brain. You're going to learn a ton. I am joined on the podcast today by Aaron Hodges. She is the digital communications manager for the Colorado Rockies. Uh, welcome to the podcast today, Aaron. Hey, Neil. So excited. We finally made this happen after so long. And I've listened to so many episodes. So now that I'm actually here, this is going to be so fun. <laughs> oh, making me blush. Erin is someone I've followed her career for years now. I, I always tell her that I, she seems like she's been in this space forever and she's still young, but doing awesome things already and moving up quickly. Um, but Erin, tell us about your career path. You've been able to get a ton of great experience um, and tell us about your stops along the way and any uh, tips or wisdom that you want to pass on to listeners. Yeah. So, I mean, it's hard to try to like condense all this and that's not me being like full of myself. I just, there's a lot there, but I will try to do what I can to, to kind of simplify it. Uh, but I guess it kind of all started when I actually took DECA in high school, which is like marketing uh, for high school slash college students. Um, they kind of have both. And I just like took this course and I kind of fell in love with, with marketing as a whole. Um, but I actually had this project where you get to like, I guess, put out an idea to like actual companies. 
Um, and it got me to like nationals slash internationals. And it was all about social media marketing. And this was back in 2012. So before really any like brands got on top of it and the CEO actually like stopped me in the hallway and was like, you should do something with this because you're really good at it and you're smart. And I know that social is going to go really far. I know crazy, right? A CEO saying that. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I just kind of like took that to heart. I initially wanted to be a doctor. Clearly, I'm very far from that. Uh, but yeah, I just kind of fell in love with marketing and social media. And I ended up really wanting to dive into sports because I played sports throughout my entire life. And if I couldn't play it, then I wanted to just work in it. And I really, really enjoyed it. So I ended up getting into NYU and their uh, sports management program with an emphasis in digital media marketing. So went there in 2013, that was when I started. And I'm just kind of like a go-getter. And the first thing, like the very first day, my advisor said stuff about like, oh, go get internships, go get jobs, do all this. Mm -hmm. But they kind of like assumed you were gonna do that when you're like a sophomore or a junior. <laughs> um, and I took it right away and I literally applied for like a bunch of internships and I ended up getting one with the Heisman Trophy because they're actually in New York City, yeah. uh, the Heisman Trophy Trust. And I ended up actually not being able to do the internship because I was a freshman. Uh, NYU had this rule back then that they were like, oh, you can't uh, get credit hours until you're a sophomore above. And I was like, well, I kind of already got the job. So <laughs> ended up just like doing it as a volunteer opportunity awesome. and then actually fighting for students to be able to get internships as a freshman down the way. So I got to actually be a part of that, which is really nice. And now freshmen can. So that's fun. That's um, so, yeah, I did that. And that was kind of like my first. OK, I love sports. I love marketing. I want to just dabble in it. And I kind of just got to help out in a lot of different areas for the Heisman ceremony. Um, who, who, who won that year? Is this RG3 or is the year after? That was Johnny Menzel's year, I think. Okay. That's not a bad one to be at. Yeah. So fun story. Uh, it snowed that day mm -hmm. uh, of the actual ceremony and I was carrying credentials through the hotel lobby and it was tile. Uh, tile was wet. Aaron was in heels. Aaron can't walk in heels. <laughs> Slipped and fell literally right in front of the group of all the potential winners. It was <laughs> super fun. Um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's Aaron's story. Um, so that, that was kind of like my freshman year of how like, I just like wanted to kind of dabble and really just again, kind of my whole theory on everything that I did in my career of okay, if you want it, like, go get it. And there's nothing really stopping you except for one, a no. And if it's a no, go somewhere else and go find that yes. Uh, as well as just like wanting to get experience wherever and whenever I could. Um, my well, advisor- Before we get into the next, the next stop of your many experiences, um, you, you seem to get it really early on that working in sports meant not just loving sports, but loving the business of sports, the marketing of sports. Like, did you just make that connection like right away or like before you even got to college of, Hey, there's a, there's a way to work in sports and it's not, and just being the biggest fan is not the way to do it. Uh, I mean, I kind of understood that from just like, even again, back to like high school of like, you just have to love it, but you have to understand the actual work part of it. Yeah. Not just you understand the product or you understand like what you're selling or what you're doing. You have to actually like, be good at what you do mm. um and then from the actual like you want to work aspect that really came my freshman year we we had um like advisors in college mm. uh and my advisor he's freaking fantastic again he was the one that that told me all about like go out get jobs things like that kind of along the same line of you you have to focus more on your your skills and your abilities and yes you have to love the sport because you're going to be working in it every single day, but it doesn't, you can't necessarily come off as like the fan because being a fan is probably going to actually be a negative to you getting a job. Yeah. No, it's, a, a, it's, it's well put. So keep, keep going uh, after the Heisman <laughs> Trust. Um, where did, where did, where'd you go next? Uh, so after that, I ended up actually coming home. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, and I wanted to get some experience in the college space. Um, obviously there's different varying levels of sport, uh, and so I wanted to do something in college. So I worked at Creighton University, 
in their athletic department and I got to do an entire summer there and I kind of that's where I started doing some Photoshop stuff because I had to make print collateral um, as well as some digital social media collateral and then even down to like making schematics of stadiums for stadium seating charts and selling tickets and things like that. Yeah, uh, It was a wide variety of things, but the most important thing to me was it was college because I, I know that it was so different from anything in pro sports. Um, not only just I'm working a million different types of sports, but just the, the industry as a whole is, is so much different than anything in pro. Uh, after that, um, being who I am, I really wanted to work in hockey. Like that was kind of like the end goal I always had in mind was, okay, I played hockey. I love hockey. I want to work in hockey. Mm -hmm. So I was like applying for tons of internships at the NHL and just like nothing was coming back. I was a sophomore. I was young. It was just really difficult to try and, and get something. And instead I ended up reaching out to the NWHL and the commissioner of the league. And it was their first season. And as a female in hockey, it just like, really spoke to me and I was like, okay, what if I could be a part of this in this first season? What could I do? Yeah. So I reached out and I kind of built myself an opportunity. And again, it was more of like a startup at the time. So not the same as me going to the Colorado Rockies and being right. like, can I make myself a job? <laughs> um, but they ended up actually hiring me and I was a marketing intern and I built all the social media platforms from scratch. Uh, I helped in ticketing. I, I designed different like collateral assets, again, going back to like Photoshop and everything. And I also helped on partnerships. Uh, I made like I helped at the partnership that they have with like Dunkin Donuts and things like that, uh, all in their very first season. So that was really special to me. And again, spoke like to what I really love. And it, it was really fun to be a part of. Yeah. After that, I ended up taking a break. Actually, I know, shocker, I stopped working. <laughs> um, but I actually went to like study abroad. Um, and why I think that that's important to like talk about is yes, internships and, and working is, is great. But like, what other experiences can you get that can maybe add to your repertoire? And it's not necessarily going to be your work, it's just experience as a whole. And I wanted that global vision of, of everything that is the world. Um, and plus, I love traveling. So, ended up studying abroad. And then during that, obviously, I wanted to try to plan for when I come back. And I applied for an internship at the US Olympic Committee. So this was 2016. So it was Rio Olympic year. And they had a, an opportunity in their e commerce marketing department. So kind of more selling than it is like actual social media or anything like that. So got to work in the New York office, everything and everything e commerce website um sales uh working with like their nike partnership things like that yeah. all during the actual rio olympics so that was an incredible opportunity and super super thankful for that and still keep in contact with all of them and, it, and it's awesome uh after that again i'm just like pretty much every semester i was like hey what can i do next yeah i was, I was gonna say like <laughs> it's not it's not paying attention Aaron is still a, still a college student at this point. Yeah, we're, we're still in college year. Um, basically, each of these, because like internships, for the most part, are like by semester. Yeah. Sometimes you'll get lucky by year. But when I was doing them, a lot of them were more by semester. Okay. So, um, and a lot of people, they could ask, they're like, oh, well, why didn't you like go back for another like section of it or another semester or another year, whatever it might have been. And my answer to that is like, again, I wanted experience in different areas yeah so if i'm just doing like you get four four years of college so eight semesters i get eight chances to go learn something different um versus always doing the same thing now if i could work a full season obviously that's great but when you're a college student it's a lot harder to work a full season because most of them don't start in august right. through may so it's really hard um it's a lot easier by semester so for me, I always took it just one semester at a time uh, and continuously just built that experience. Um, going back to like hockey, I really, again, I really love that. So I kept trying for different opportunities in hockey while also keeping my eyes open for kind of other things. Mm -hmm. But an opportunity popped up with the Colorado Avalanche, my neighbors now. Yeah. Um, and it was actually in their media relations department. So I was kind of finding as I was digging through like job descriptions of things that I loved or things that I could hope for in a dream job, it really came back to like being able to do media relations stuff, being able to work with players, interview players, um, create press releases, 
again, jobs change all the time, but that's what it was when I was looking yeah. for like that dream job or So I tried for media relations and I ended up getting one with the Colorado Avalanche. I moved once again to a different city for the <laughs> summer and I did media relations work for the Avs. I got into writing. So really, really got better at, at long form writing. I wrote tons of articles. Uh, I got better with interviewing and public speaking. Um, and I also got that experience in a front office. Um, being yeah. able to say that you work directly with a GM that you work directly with directors and VPs um, was crucial. And so I, there's so much that I learned in that year that I didn't think I did until I used it later. Um, but it was definitely very, very helpful to me. And I mean, funny enough, like my first article that came out was Kale McCarr because that was his draft year. And so thinking of it now and like where he is and what he did, I was like, I mean, you're welcome. I hyped you up. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, and so that was so summer before my senior year. And now I'm kind of like, sweet, got that done. I did it. I loved it. Uh, I would love to keep doing it. But again, they were then going to hire for like a new semester and I had to be in Colorado mm -hmm. to do it. And unfortunately, I can't live in Colorado and also go to school for my senior right. year. So I couldn't stay on. In that case, I had to find something back in New York. And the last thing on my checklist was um, like business development partnerships. And then like the player side of things. So what about player marketing? Obviously it's starting to grow social media, not just for brands, but also the athletes themselves. And like, what does that look like? So I really narrowed my search down by this time. I had all this experience kind of in my bag of what I can like offer. So I was learning like one, it was a lot easier to get interviews now, but two, I can be more specific with what I want. So I actually ended up applying to this place called Vayner Sports that I genuinely had no idea what it was. I didn't understand the impact of what it had. It was just an all-encompassing opportunity that allowed me to learn about partnerships, learn about social media, and run player social media. And I kind of looked at that opportunity. I was like, that's exactly what I want. So let's yeah. go. Um, ended up getting it. That was great. And on my very first day, I like go into the office and I'm just like, cool, Vayner, Vayner Chuck. I kind of understood who Gary was and people look at me now and they're like, how the heck did you not know who Gary Vayner Chuck was? <laughs> you love social media. Apparently I was very naive at the time. Uh, <laughs> but like my very first day, I have to like go into his office and like meet him. And oh, then wow. all of a sudden it like hit me of who he was. And I was like, oh, <laughs> this giant like sky rise office and then like going up there and I was like, Oh, well, all right. This is going to be a much better opportunity than I even thought it was going to be. Um, and really just took everything from that got to like be on team Gary V in essence, because banner sports at the time was, was brand new. Mm -hmm. Um, and just learned a lot again from the partnership side of things, which is vital for revenue in terms of social media to um, even the legal side of things. Um, got to learn about like actual contracts for athletes. I mean, I kind of touched all sorts of different things. Um, and that was kind of like the end of what I did internship wise. So if that's like six or seven, it was a lot. <laughs> and now I'm like, cool, done. I'm graduating, sweet. I have all this stuff. How can I get a full-time job? How do I actually get paid for, for what I know and what I do? So yeah. started applying for jobs and this was, I graduated in the winter actually. So I graduated in December of 2017 mm -hmm. and there wasn't a ton of jobs. Uh, winter job search in the sports world isn't as high as it is like come in the like spring to summer months. Right. And I applied to a bunch more internship opportunities and I got a lot of them. One of them was actually with an MLB team and it was between that or a full-time job with bodybuilding.com. And I just kind of had to sit there and I was like, do I want another internship and it's with a sports team and that's great. Or do I kind of like take a chance on this full-time job, you know, benefits, everything else yeah. that also allows me to learn more in social media specifically. And I can actually run things and, and get that experience, but it's not sports. And so many people will tell you, oh, you got to take the sports one. Like you want to work in sports. You have to take that. But to me, I was just like, I don't think at that time MLB wasn't right for me. 
it didn't feel right at the time. I wasn't like feeling it as much. And I was just like, I really think I could do this full-time job and like get out of sports for a little bit and then someday get back into it when I have even more experience. All my mentors told me the same thing. They were like, you're going to get that experience later and you're going to find the right opportunity you love later on. Um, So I ended up saying no to that. And I still look back on that day, especially now that I work in MLB. I'm like, wow, what the world would have told me way back then. And I have no idea what would have happened. I'm sure it would have been a fantastic opportunity. And I'm so grateful that they even offered me like that job. Again, anything in sports is very hard to get. So still thankful for that. Um, But yeah, ended up leaving sports as crazy as it sounds. I ran social for bodybuilding.com. I started as a coordinator, worked my way up to a manager level in under a year there and kind of headed up all things there. And I mean, they have 3 million followers on pretty much every single platform that they had except for Twitter. Um, So, I mean, there was a large reach. There was a lot that I did, lots of campaigns. It was more selling, but then also I worked in like influencer marketing and working with athletes in that way. Um, So it was cool. I loved it. I also got to travel. They do expos and things. So I got to go to events um, not only run social, but then again, work with athletes and, and the influencers and, and kind of coordinating them as well as creating content with them. And then all of the brands that we sold through. So it was a very all encompassing type of role that got me a lot of experience. And then similarly, I went to another fitness health, um, kind of business where our VP at the time actually left. And then he kind of was like, Hey, you're really good. And we need someone in this world to like come at this brand. Like, would you be open to it? And so I was like, okay, I could, I could consider it. And it was higher pay. And it was, you know, again, that growth in my career. So I was like, sure. All right, let's do this. I ended up moving to Texas, did a very, very similar role, except uh, a lot bigger. So now I had to run basically six brand accounts as well as 50 store accounts for each of our retail (laughs) stores. I mean, again, just a massive undertaking of like, okay, experience. And again, going back to everything Aaron does is always what, what is it going to do for me? Not just what can I offer? I mean, you're always going to offer your talents and skills, but how's it going to help me grow? Yeah. Uh, So yeah, experience. That was really cool. Uh, Each of those were for a year. So now we're two years post-graduation and that would have been 2019. And all of a sudden I was really just missing sports. I loved the fitness world. I did. But at the end of the day, I really wanted to work in sports and I kept seeing all these opportunities pop up and I stayed in contact with my network throughout all of this time period. um, Just to a, like keep in touch with that world. Um, B networking is so important. And all of a sudden, just like more and more jobs were kind of opening up. And I was like, do I, do I try for these? Like, am I really going to be good enough? And so ended up reaching out to a few of my contacts and ended up applying to quite a few of them. But the one that I really loved was the one with the Tampa Bay Rays and back to baseball. I know crazy. (laughs) Um, But I really just like the opportunity was right. It was all about digital marketing. It was social media, but I could also learn about email. I could be, we had like an in-house creative team Mm. versus like always going to the agency side. I mean, there was just something about it. And then it was Florida. That was really cool. And I also love the idea that it was a small market team. Um, I liked the challenge of that, but I also love the opportunity that it came with. Okay, you're not this like big city, big team that is stuck in their ways of what they have to do in terms of marketing. Um, And I also knew that I was going to have a really sweet boss. So ended up taking that one, moved myself once again to St. Petersburg, Florida. And yeah, I started working in baseball and that's kind of how I got my start in the baseball world. So love it. That was a lot. (laughs) I, I mean, I'm just, I'm blown away. I mean, I, I knew your story. I really hope the listeners at this point are just like, oh my gosh, does she like ever stay somewhere? No, I, I, it, I think what's looking back on how impressive it is that you've been so intentional every step along the way. And, and, and you and I were, you know, joking, not even joking, but just chatting offline a little bit about these inflection points and how cognizant you are of what each decision you make, <sighs> how it affects your career and, 
And you came in, I mean, you were a rocket from day, even before you got to college, you knew what you wanted. You knew what you want to do. You had almost a checklist of these are the skills I want to make sure I get. And by the time you were done with college, you had such a well-rounded like set of skills and experiences that made you a commodity and has continued to make you a commodity. And you talked about, you continued even the networking side, which helped you eventually get to the raise. And, and it's just, uh, you know, my hat, my hat's off to you. Uh, uh, just incredible stuff and, and you've earned your way uh, throughout and it's a, it's a great thing for, for folks to emulate is to, to be intentional about what you're doing and I, I when I talk to young students now trying to come from the space I I do basically echo what you were preaching around thinking about what skills what skills is going to help you develop you know how is this going to make you better when you leave here right? when you leave that job or what, for the next job wherever it might be so just Great, great stuff, and uh, I really enjoyed hearing you, hearing your uh, your thought your thoughtful storytelling as well. And like when it came to all those, is like yes, I got seven. If you think about this, like there were seven internships there, right? Like that's a lot, and that's really great. But the amount of no's that I got along the way too, people don't talk about that enough. Like they'll look at me and they'll be like, "Oh, you got so many opportunities, you had so many yeses," and I'm like. Yeah, but do you, that you're not seeing the 500 no's or like the rant, like the companies I didn't get to work for that, like I thought I could work for, or thought I had the experience for, or the amount of interviews or the amount of people and networking that I did for even just like getting certain interviews or being able to put my resume in front of people or just discussions and actually, you know, making friends with people. Like nobody ever sees that work. They only see, cool, you had seven opportunities. And right. I, if I could give a lesson to anybody in, in college, it's one, don't be afraid of the no's. Go apply for those things. Because guess what? You're going to get a no, but someone's going to say yes to you. Someone's going to give you that chance, but you're never going to get that chance if all you're scared of is a no. Totally. So yeah, I mean, Go after it. Find random skills that you want or that you see are opportunities, aka go look at a job description of what you hope to do one day. Yeah. what are the things you need and then from there build out that was the one thing i did and i think it really helped me a lot that's one of my favorite things to tell people I'm like it, it, there's a cheat sheet it's it's right there for you and, and they're gonna be i guarantee you it's gonna be in different areas again I, I didn't just stay in social because i thought i wanted to do social media marketing that encompasses a million different things and so likely it's not going to be you just sitting and running Twitter all day. It's going to be you finding those different areas. And then that's where you're going to get the easier yeses too along the way for those internships. Cause it might not be something that's just, Oh, it's yes, it's a social media internship, but maybe it's something a little bit different or a smaller area. And I think, and, and I, I want to you know, certainly hear about your, your roles in baseball and we'll, we'll get into that. But, but I, I think the fact that you had all that well-rounded experience really make, makes you a valuable commodity in your role with social and digital because part of that learning curve for some folks that come up in the social game and, and think about they're just creating content all the time or you know pressing send on various tweets and Facebook posts and Instagram posts is they don't necessarily think about how it all connects to the, the main business goals and how this connects to email, which connects to commerce, which connects to revenue, which connects to partnerships, which connects to communications and team operations. And, and you got that because you spent time in all those areas and got to, got to learn about it. So I think that that makes you a better social and digital marketer today because you can't connect those dots. It's natural. Yeah. Marketing is, there's so many things in marketing and you uh, ultimately to get a job in sports, you have to be good at all the different pieces or at least have an interest, especially when you're young in learning whatever that is yeah. um so yeah if, if i could harp on anything is like kids just need to not get stuck in this like one idea of what marketing is or what social media is and be willing to get different skill sets and things in their tool belt in order to make them more versatile and yes that might come at a cost of one different unpaid internships as sad as it is and i hopefully that can change and that's a whole nother podcast topic that i think we could go on um but just like, how can you become the most versatile person? Because that's going to up your value and people aren't going to want to say no to you when you have so many different skills. Totally. Really well put. I, I, I want to hear about now, like when you start with the raise and you are, it's not an internship, you're going all in, you're starting with a team. What's that process like first to move from what you were doing previously on the brand side 
and getting getting to know a team. And yes, you mentioned that they, they don't have the the history of the, the legacy of the Yankees or the Red Sox or whatever. And so there is the opportunity to kind of be creative and be original. So what was it like kind of learning the brand and learning how their team function and making that mind shift go from, okay, I'm no longer selling supplements to customers. And, and yes, there's a, you know, certainly social and community elements of that. Um, but now we have fans and I'm selling emotion a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, you put it right. There is one, how do we sell the emotion of what the raise is and how can we connect with our fans on that basis? Uh, and two is literally my one thing I did was ask questions mm -hmm. and you're coming in as a new, as a new person to a new company. And the last thing you want to do is feel like you're a burden by asking questions. But when you're asking it in a way that's going to help and you're willing to learn something and do your research and, and try to get yourself embedded as much as humanly possible, as fast as possible, you're no longer a burden because ultimately it's going to help you. So the big thing that I did was one, my boss was there for four years at the time. And so really just trying to pick his brain a little bit on who are we, what do we do and what are we about? And then how can we then like take all of that knowledge into like actually creating a strategy from it? Yeah. And yes, actually create a strategy from it, not just posting to post. Um, uh, and then two, actually just like trying to work with, again, the front office and the players and then learning as much as possible, because again, it's their stories, not yours. It's not the Aaron show. It's not the, technically it's the Ray social show, but it's not, it's like, it's the Ray's organization and you're speaking on behalf of them. So what I really tried to do was just learn about what we were and then try to put that in terms of social media content and, and digital marketing and how that all can create actual storylines to what we do. Yeah. And to hark on that point of, of aligning with what the team is about is so cool. Like one of the coolest things is when the, what the, how the, what the players are saying in the locker room, how the coaches are talking, when that, echoes on the social media and vice versa when everyone's kind of speaking the same language like that is that's the goal that's the golden standard that not not too many organizations can do that but it's it's super cool when it when it does happen because it, it shows that authenticity when all of a sudden a player is doing an interview and he's saying the same slogan that is also the team's hashtag for example and it's like holy crap they're they're not just blowing smoke here like this is really what the team is about so what what, what were the, what were the rays about and and how'd you go about trying to convey that from a, a tactical perspective yeah, I mean, all encompassing if I had to like pick like one thing is like I called us like the underdogs of the MLB world. And so then you're kind of like, OK, so you're the underdog. So like, what does that mean? That means like one, we can be a little bit more snarky in terms of our tone. Um, it means taking advantage of those big moments and making them probably bigger than they are. <laughs> um but like making the most out of like any of like the big and or small moments that happen to your team. Maybe it's, again, we have 162 games, but like if something happens, even if it's a midday game on a Wednesday, if something really major happens, like taking advantage of that moment and making it something big. Yeah. Um, it means taking advantages of the rivalries that you have um, and kind of blowing those out. Obviously Rays Yankees. That was like our big one, obviously Rays Red Sox, but Rays Yankees was our, that was like our core of like, okay, when we, when we can, how do we voice that and who are we? And then lastly, it was about like always being hungry. And that kind of turned into our campaign um, for the yeah. entire brand was um, like, stay hungry. Um, and then they, they made the postseason, but they didn't end up winning. So then into 2020 was all about, okay, well, how can we stay hungry for what we want, which is winning the world series. And, and then kind of taking that general idea and then, making content and ideas and storylines from there. And, and I imagine that the fans certainly buy into that, but I, because I, I think as an outside observer, there is the narrative of the Rays are whatever, the ugly duckling sometimes, or the, the, the team that, you know, with the stadium that needs, that needs improvement or the, the, the fans don't come to games enough and, and all like with that as kind of a backdrop or a framing, like, do you almost use that? And is that part of the underdog story? And, and then, and then and how, do you, how do you go about like amplifying that brand so that it gets fans to, yes, become uh, uh, emotionally invested in the, with the Rays, but also then the day, hopefully get more, more butts and seats as well uh, in the local St. Pete and Tampa area? Yeah, we use it, but it's not overusing it, right? It's about using it in the right times and also the right platforms. Mm -hmm. um, 
so I mean, at the time, a big one for us was I pretty much obviously started the uh, the TikTok platform, and that was kind of again, that's where we can be a little bit more fun, like let loose a little bit, and we really nodded to those pieces and kind of the receipt life of if people say things, uh, how can we kind of like poke some fun at that? I remember a lot um, of stuff. But then we also did it in different ways, of course, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever it might be, and, and doing it in our own way that speaks to those points, but it doesn't always have to be just like directly, if that makes sense. It's yeah. always just like that hidden note or hidden voice or tone that you're coming off with certain things. I, I, I do want to I, I spend just a minute on TikTok because you, you did start your TikTok and you guys did do a good job. And I thought probably better than most teams even today did a really good job of getting players to, to have fun with you. And that's something that you look at a lot of sports out there now like on TikTok. They're just repurposing highlights in, in creative ways, but it's not really the human part of it is missing a little bit. And I thought that was a, an early thing that, that caught my eye from, from your guys' TikTok back in those days. So to, tell me a little about, about that that strategy, that development, and, and how you got to, to make it happen. Is it weird that we're saying back in those days when it was a year ago? <laughs> like, I know, it feels like a decade. <laughs> um, yeah, so like my whole thing with, with TikTok was honestly like the human element. Um, yeah. Maybe it's voicing who we are as the social team, but obviously more is so like the players. How can we show their personalities? How can we have fun with the music and the culture? than we can maybe on some other platforms and how that voice came about was honestly it's ever changing um but like our big end goal was be fun and be relatable that was pretty much my okay this is if if it's not fun it's not relatable it's probably not going to go out um and from there we just kind of always tried to stay on trend or we tried to stay in the moment of certain things we didn't Obviously, it's great that the TikTok algorithm will always consistently push out content at different times. So your content will always be on, I guess, in a way. But I didn't want something that was like a week ago to go out. It still felt very timeline-ish to me. So I always tried to stay with that, um, be on top of trends. And then also like influencer marketing. I thought a lot of teams didn't take advantage of the space um on tiktok even though it's large and there's so many creators out there um and it's a lot different this year than it is last year but when we were there nobody was really taking advantage of that so diving into our influencers um and trying to make them a part of the content and it's funny that you say players because in 2020 we actually didn't have a lot of access to our guys right um so it was about being creative with what we could get um and then making it feel as if it was directly with our players, which is a lot harder than it <laughs> than it thought of in the original time. But it was kind of like, how can we take a piece of content but make it feel like our players are directly there with us, or that we were there in that moment filming it? Yeah, and it, it's it's a whole other skill set too to, to to try to create for that platform. It's it, it was different, and something I've, I've always admired about you, Aaron, is and it speaks to your how you came up as well is you you have been a go-getter you have not you you have learned skills proactively you have learned platforms proactively so just talk about like how do you go about learning a new platform how do you go about learning a new skill is something that you like do you write down okay i want to learn this i'm going to go on youtube and learn everything i can i'm going to talk to people that know what they're doing or or is there sometimes cases where I could learn this to be just uh, good enough, but also uh, there's going to be other people that I may need to bring in or work with our in-house team that are better at it than me. Yeah. So like in terms of TikTok, it was kind of like I was interested in it and I loved it and I love the platform. And then it was an opportunity for us and nobody else could really take it on like mm -hmm. work wise. And so it was kind of like my baby. It was my project. So it was kind of like I had to do all of this in order to make it work. And that means learning things. That means, yeah, I absolutely 100% reached out to other people, not only in sports, but in other industries too, about TikTok and what I could learn from it. Um, maybe it was sitting in seminars. Maybe it was actually reaching out directly to TikTok. They have an incredible sports partnerships team. Mm -hmm. So really just trying to learn that and then executing it. I think that the downside is that a lot of people will learn things about platforms, but then they won't go and actually like execute it. And so I was super grateful with the opportunity to, okay, we're trying this. There is no failing on TikTok. Like what if we went and tried this out? What happens? 
Um, as long as we're in our guardrails and we're not yeah. <laughs> making the brand look bad in any sort of way, how can we, you know, make something different on TikTok and, and constantly just having the freedom to do that? And then when it comes to other skill sets that are just like simply job related, absolutely. I, I don't sit here and have like a to-do list by any means of like what I want, but if I need it or I want it, I will take the time to go learn it. And yes, that might mean less sleep. Yes, that might mean that I have to like take something else off my plate in order to take it on. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just about being diligent on how much do you care about learning whatever that skill is? How much do you care about learning something new to add and to be able to grow in your career. Um, And a lot of that, you know, it could come from YouTube. It can come from seminars. It can come from, you know, a lot of it comes from my mentors and people in the industry. Mm -hmm. Um, I take a lot of learnings from everyone in in our world. And I think that that's what makes me the best is I'm not sitting here just looking at MLB. Maybe I'm looking at NBA. Maybe I'm looking at tennis. Maybe I'm looking at lacrosse. Maybe I'm looking at F1. Like that world is crazy right now. I think there's just a lot of areas to learn and what people are doing well and just being okay with, you know, saying you suck at something <laughs> and getting better at it. No, I told, and, and like one of my favorite things is when, when you see something really cool that someone else did is, okay, don't just say that's, that's just really cool. Like try to recreate it. See if you can, if you can get to the point where you can reproduce it or something close to it, then you're going to learn a lot along the way. And, and similarly too, when I see a campaign that's really good, I like to, th- to tell students as well as myself sometimes of, okay, h- what is, how did this campaign start? Like, what does the campaign brief look like? What were their goals? What resources do they need? If you can start to, th- to, to recreate and reproduce those things, you're going to, your, your skills, it's going to grow quite a bit along the way. Yeah. When it comes to like actual content creation, if like we want to dive into that, it's that it's unbelievable the amount that I've had to learn in terms of, okay, you actually have to make stuff. It's no longer, okay, you have an idea. Uh, yeah, you want to create this graphic. Uh, awesome. Cool. Well, guess what? If you don't have a team there to be able to make it for you, then you have to learn whatever that skill is. Yeah. So cool. I learned Photoshop. Awesome. Okay. Then I was finding like last year with TikTok. Okay. I have to be able to make TikToks. What does that mean? Oh, that means you have to know video editing. I didn't know video editing. I knew some like basic, like cutting highlight kind of things and being able to splice something together on an iPhone app, but it wasn't like major premiere editing by any means. And I was like, okay, well, you're telling me that I can't go and use somebody else in order to make this. So I have to learn it. Okay. I'm going to learn it. And then being okay with sucking and failing at that and being not perfect and still like, being able to make stuff and getting better at it and mastering it. Um, yeah. I just think like learning, you're always going to be learning. If you're not learning something new in, in you work in social media or content creation, if you're not willing to learn something new, like you're just holding yourself back because you're going to have to keep learning and getting better and like leave your ego at the door. Honestly, like come into work every day saying you suck at it. Just, just do that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let's, let's t- touch on that real quick, though. And just a, a few minutes left here with Aaron Hodges, digital communication manager for the Colorado Rockies. We could seriously just talk all day, Aaron. I, I, I love this so much. Um, <laughs> as, it, social media people are extremely versatile. They have to be five tool players to use a baseball term, if not six or seven tools. Um, and where do you see uh, – do you see that continuing to be the way things are that you're going to be expected to wear all hats as opposed to – having it be having more specialized positions, having more help. I mean, we talk about the burnout of social to some degree. We talk about the fact that social, you need the, the, the list of skills required to be a social media manager is often just ridiculously mind boggling and, and just almost absurd sometimes. So like, is that the way it's going to be that you're going to need to be part creative, part strategy, part copywriter, parts uh, uh, analytics. Like, is, is that just how it is? I think it's going to start to change in time, uh, especially as we see this kind of like digital transition is now we're moving more dollars and more resources into digital than we are like other areas of marketing. I think it'll start to change. But I think because I'm going to preach this to people who are younger um, versus like older in the industry, I don't think it'll ever go away that you should know at least like the bare minimum of something. Um, 
I think you should be able to somewhat make graphics. I think you should kind of know somewhat of how to edit videos. I think you should be able to know somewhat of analytics and strategy to what you're creating. I think that you will want like that baseline bare minimum of different areas, but I don't think you have to be a master, which is what it feels like right now that social media managers need to master graphic design, video, analytics, um, PR, and every other thing else, but like they're required to be super good at it. And that's where like the burnout comes out. It, I think it could be a lot different if it's just kind of like, you should know how to do it, but you're not required to. Yeah. Sense. Yeah, totally. I always say like, know enough to be dangerous. And, and also too, yes. know enough to know what goes into it. So that when you make a request to someone whose job it is to do it, you're not like, can I get 12 graphics in the next couple of days? Yes. Like, original <laughs> graphics. Like, you know, okay, this takes two, three, four hours and patience and and what's reasonable and what's not reasonable. So I, 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 all that, that is stuff. such a huge point and something that I think that's even just how I really started wanting to get into even all these areas is like, if I go make a request of somebody of a graphic, I want to know the terminology. I want to know like the basics of what they do. I certainly want to be able to respect what they do, not just like feel like I'm asking this and, and have no idea what happens on the other side. Um, totally. Yeah. The respect of what other people do in your, in your like office and the things that you're asking for um, is huge. And I think it also just betters your relationships with those different areas because you're willing to like, A, care about the world and learn it, uh, but B, that that respect is there from the very beginning and it's not like you're better than anyone else. You totally. know? It's, it's, it's just like how, uh, you know, a, a, a hitter might learn to respect a pitcher and what they go through every day, even though they only play every five days sometimes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. let's, let's, let's finish off a little, bit, a little bit on the Rockies though, because I mean, I, know, I actually work for the Rockies, not the Rays now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, an organization that has a great reputation for being a, a team of the people. Their brand is very interactive and, and social. I, I say brand, but social media in particular. Um, so talk about coming into there. And yes, you had the Rays now and, and, and you're on your mind, top of mind. You understood them, them from top to bottom. Now you enter into a new franchise you know, and, and a new season and what's that, what's that process like of learning who they are, what made them good, but also what things you can bring to take them to a new level. Yeah. I think at least from like the experience in MLB that really helped me. Cause I kind of had a general idea. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you see the content day in and day out, you see kind of the direction that they're moving. You can kind of understand their voice and you pretty much understand everybody's voice. Um, not only just for your understanding, but also then say you play the team um can really have an impact on kind of like how you're going to go about that content for that particular game or interactions with that team whatever it might be so i felt like i had a very good understanding of what they were um i also knew at the time i knew julian valentin very well valentine sorry i'm stupid um <laughs> and i just I, I just had like a really good feeling for what that opportunity could be and i saw the job opening and i it was actually like a side to side role. They were both coordinator roles. And so like, I wasn't moving up. I wasn't like, it wasn't much different. It was a very similar job to what I had, but it was just with a different team. Mm -hmm. um, the difference at least being, at least in my mind and why I ultimately went to the Rockies was just that potential for growth. And then kind of, again, what I was able to do in that role, what I oversaw, um, maybe like what I could like manage and what I could produce, what I could do. Mm -hmm. um, was just a lot higher than what I could at the Rays. And so just kind of took that leap of faith on, on what it could be, um, not only for the 2021 season, but then in beyond. Um, and then what I could just like bring to the table. And a big thing that uh, the Rockies wanted was more emphasis on creative and more emphasis on how can we be better at what we do from a brand perspective, not just, yes, we're the fun team and we have like really out of the box ideas, but how can we start, um, being more diligent and being like uh, put out a lot higher quality of the actual creative. Uh, and that takes, you know, the experience of being on different teams and also just that desire in somebody who wants to build that out. So that was kind of my initial role. And then ultimately I actually moved up to be uh, the digital communications manager. And then I ended up hiring two people under me who 
uh, are absolutely incredible what they do. Um, and they're a lot stronger again in that kind of graphic design and video world. And then I'm kind of there to help mentor them and teach them like the social and social strategy side of things so that we can be a well-rounded team. So, 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 t- so you come in and it's, oh, we want to elevate our brand. We want to do more with creative. So you had that mandate and then what's the process like saying, okay, well, we want to get up to here. Um, it's an audio podcast. So I don't know why I'm doing anything with my hand. <laughs> uh, if we want to get up to here, then this is what we need to make it happen. Like, it's, it's not just free, first of all. We need, we need people, we need time, we need resources. So is, like, is the fact that mandate was already in place kind of, is that what helped it along a little bit? Or do you, do you have to almost kind of learn to justify as well that there is an ROI of, of having a, a strong, cohesive, and powerful brand? Uh, both, I think. Um, obviously, coming in when you have that like mandate, in essence, again, I'm doing hand quotes. <laughs> um, at least you have the understanding that like there's going to be that buy in. And for anything that we do in social, you have to have that buy in to what the vision is and what some and what you want um, for your brand and as a strategy. So we kind of had that buy in. And then it was a process of like, okay, what are the steps to get there? And it's not a one year plan. Um, I can't come in and expect to just make all these changes right away. It was about, okay, how can we lay the foundation for now? And then in the future, what are the different steps that we need to take to get to where we want to go? And it's about creating a five-year plan, not a one-year plan and expecting greatness in that one year. Um, And I think coming in and realizing that and being able to ease your expectations in that meantime was super important for us, but also um, just being able to kind of plan it out and just realize that it's going to be a long-term effort. And right now we're just going to take the steps to get there. Yeah. I, I, I like that. And I, I, there's a, there's a joke in there somewhere around the, the Rockies and their plans to become a world series contender again, but I'm not going to make it. Um. <laughs> we are next 2022 is our year. Hey, I'm I'm a, a suffering Padres fan, and at least at least like we you guys didn't go in with World Series expectations this year. The Padres did, and yeah. I was about to say you're a Padres fan, and you had you only were what four and a half, five and a half games above us this season. So, yeah. excuse me. Um. <laughs> All right, one more thing for you. This was terrible stat, Aaron. Um, and this is always a fun one, so I'm I'm gonna have you take us through it. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to ask. Give me a day in the life for a home game for Aaron Hodges for the Rockies this past season. Uh, it can be as detailed as you want from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep. Uh, what What are you doing all day? Oh, boy. So, wait. I actually sleep, right? Um, yeah. So, <laughs> typically, I wake up sometime early in the morning. Uh, I try to have a morning routine because it gets my day started. Mm-hmm. And usually, that includes some sort of caffeine and some sort of, like, movement to get, like, my brain and body ready for whatever I'm going to do that day. So usually it included a walk outside. I live in Denver now. And so I love the outdoors. Mm -hmm. I usually would take a walk. I would drink my monster energy drink or coffee. And then I would uh, get to work. And I live super close to work because I hate commuting. So five minutes to the office, boom, I'm in the office. Uh, Usually would start with some sort of meeting, different areas that could be something different every day in which it was. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'd have a couple meetings. Uh, anything in terms of content wise that would go out, uh, let's say that we're, this is during a homestand. So we're probably going to put out different pieces of content from the game before, um, especially if we win, which hopefully it was coming off of a win. That'd be lovely. Um, any sort of, yeah, again, recapping content for that morning, uh, would go out and typically we would try to schedule that. Um, but given the, the, all the just the changes in the world of 2020 and 2021 we usually didn't actually schedule too much yeah. because then you'd have to be able to have your laptop on you at uh and you're just gonna have to be there anyway to delete so usually we just live schedule um and then after all those meetings i would meet with my two uh assistants and kind of just plan out what that day would look like for that game um have lunch hopefully somewhere in there to be able to eat and then BP normally started around three. Mm-hmm. Uh, we didn't always cover. When you have 162 games, we tried to make every single game different. So we tried not to always cover it in the same way or if we would cover it at all. It just kind of depends on the day, what we're feeling, what our fans uh, might like that day. Uh, also, is it a theme game? 
here at the Rockies, we love our Rockies theme oh, game. Yes. So again, that would either come something that we pre-planned that day, or uh, usually it was something weeks in advance to what we could um, do as a theme game for that day, cover BP, and then uh, get all that content. So say we cover it. Awesome. Did that. Then we would start to like look at everything that came in. Uh, we also have the help of our MLB LCCs. So we would look through actually Greenfly and our lovely partnership with Greenfly. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll add that in there. We would take all that content and then we would kind of again meet and then decide what needs to go out um, and what kind of content we want. If there anything sponsored, usually there was. So again, create for that and then start to get ready for the game. Uh, getting people in different areas that we need, get our video guy down in the well, get us up to the press box and then cover the game. Usually it would start at 640. Hopefully it would start at 640 and then cover the game as much as possible. And are uh, you guys kind of like, like you're covering Twitter, you're covering Facebook, you're covering Instagram. What was that, that responsibility like? It was really, so typically it would be myself and then uh, one assistant was with me and then one assistant was in the well uh, shooting content. And that would be like our lovely rotation. And we would kind of switch those two out. Um, but for us up in the press box, it was very much a mixed thing. Um, I didn't want anybody just like on one platform all the yeah. time. Uh, I think that again, creates a lot of burnout because then you're only creating Instagram copy. You're only creating Twitter copy. Um, and when you're a team, you kind of need everybody's input to create the best, in my opinion. So yeah. if we wanted something, say a big play happens, it would kind of be like, okay, what do we want? Where do we want it to go out? What are our copy ideas? And then from there, we would then uh, divvy out the work. Okay, you do Twitter because that idea was super great. I'll go do this on Instagram. If we even need it on Instagram, maybe it's stories. Um, oh, did somebody have a TikTok idea? Okay, well, let's mark that down for what we could do for TikTok later. Yeah. Um, and then continuously also coordinating with like our photographers, um, making sure that we can get the photo content working with the person down in the well to make sure we can get that content and then distributing it as needed. Um, as like a fun factoid of what we do, our goal is always get it out within seven minutes of a play happening. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say we hit that mark probably 90% of the time. And again, it varies on uh, speed of what we can get it, get stuff from as well as then edit it and then get it back out. Um, so yeah. I don't know how other teams operate, but uh, hey, now they know that we try within seven minutes and it's not always possible. Um, and then, yeah, that would just happen for just different plays, different everything. Yep. Paying attention to how things are happening um, and being really cognizant of also fans, um, how they're reacting, because that's also playing off of our voice. Yeah. And then um, kind of how the players are reacting. That was another reason I love people down the wells is that they can kind of like relay that information to us of, of kind of like what's happening down there nice. and then try and plan out like win content or plan out lost content. Mm -hmm. um, win content, super great. Love it. Lost content, not super great. Don't really love it, but we try to have the most fun with it. Um, this season, usually it involved the cat meme, <laughs> which <laughs> So we would start brainstorming if like it was like a really tough loss is when we really tried to do it. We would start brainstorming some ideas on if it was even the right tone for that game or if it yeah. wasn't. Um, I'm going to assume that this game it was say we lost really badly. Um, then we would start like brainstorming our lovely cat meme. And that was born out of we actually started it on the road when we didn't end up having legitimately we had no photos to use for like a loss graphic. Um, and I, it yeah. wasn't sponsored, but it was just part of our strategy was we would still always put out loss. Cause if you're going to start game coverage, I always have the opinion that you have to end the game coverage in some fashion. Uh, and we had no photos of anything. Um, and so I was like, cool. Well, what do we use as like this graphic for a game that was a complete blowout at the time. And we have no photos to use for a loss. And I just came up with the idea. I was like, well, it's really sad. So like, what if we did the sad cat meme? And it was, it would just be like super light, funny. It was against the Dodgers. So it would play really well. Um, and so we did, and then it completely blew up and fans really loved it. And then from there we were kind of like, well, what if we, 
did it for all these different games and we just did it in different ways uh that was for that particular game so we would theme it to maybe the team or the city whatever it might be yeah it was kind of born out of that and also we had coors cat earlier in the season when the cat came on uh the field so it was just kind of like born out of all that and then we would kind of use it as as needed um and that was always fun to try to brainstorm and somehow there was always something we could do it was weird and usually we didn't make them people assume like we made the memes like we would do the edits and we absolutely did not it was usually something like we found online or even our fans would make us wow so later in the season and so like we would repurpose them and, and use them and yeah that's how that one was born so that was super fun and then we would end the night if we would win cool then we have to do obviously a lot more post game content mm -hmm. uh if we lose then we try to just kind of like cut it off from there uh as much as possible to try to ease the loss and right. then go home and do it all over again yeah, one of the uh the ironies of of working in sports is you want to win, but winning also means you work a lot more and the, the season yeah. goes longer, so you work more. <laughs> but so it's like those iron the ironies, but it's fun work. So that's, that's oh, it's always fun. Um, and so if it's a win, obviously, um, some of the different things that we would do, um, again, depending on the game, baseball is so much different from every other sport because again, we just have so many games. Yeah. Um, we're not, we can't always create that lovely, fun, like hype video edit. We win um post game because literally in under 12 hours we might be playing again right that content isn't as relevant as it might be for someone that is an nfl team or even an nhl team hmm. um but we still try to do some post game content we tried to focus a lot on the players um try to get their perspective so a lot of it was like point of view type content maybe hmm. we would literally have them record something for us we would try to be in the clubhouse if we could for certain moments um, we would try to be on the field for high fives. Um, we would do stuff like with our mascot on the field. Um, we would try all sorts of different things. And then also maybe it was graphics instead. Uh, we tried to vary it. It was never the same. Uh, for us, that was probably our big thing was how can we make every single game different? Um, yeah. I never wanted it to feel that it was literally an exact replica of the game before and yeah. you're, a you're lot of teams sucks. Mon yeah. sucks. and a lot of teams fall into that and uh, i think the worst is when you go from a night game to a day game and you literally see the same exact thing within like a 12 hour span and the worst is instagram stories because you literally feel like you rewatch the same thing over again and i'm just like wait well, I, I, mean, I, I, have that? Theory, I have a conspiracy theory that people that they just keep they just reuse beat the same bp for, for instagram stories every every time and you, you can't tell the difference. Yeah, yeah. And you know, what's even worse about that, because baseball guys, they're so superstitious that they will literally wear the same t-shirt and stuff. So it's not hard to duplicate it. And I can, I tried to avoid it, I did. There might've been a few times where it's like, if again, if you absolutely need a piece of content and don't have it, you might have to repurpose something, but we usually got I would say 99% of the time we always got something new from that day yeah. uh, because especially in Colorado lighting and weather, you can't fake it. You just can't, oh, yeah. it was going to rain. It was going to be sunny. It was going to be a snow day. So then you have to actually have snow content. You can't repurpose in Denver. It's just not possible. <laughs> what, 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 one quick thing I want to get your, your take on Aaron. And then I promise because that was a terrible stat and then to our extra inning segment. Um, Something that, that came that became a bit of a theme or a talking point during the postseason this past this past year is how the the, the variance or disparity in the in the volume in which teams tweeted during games, whether it was winning or losing. You saw some teams that would tweet once when the game started and then maybe tweet one more time when the game ended, while others were a lot more active during the game. So, like, what what's your guys' take with the Rockies on? the volume during a game and how that may vary if it's a day game versus a, a night game, a home versus away. And certainly I know you haven't had the postseason experience yet there, but you did with the Rays and you know, postseason versus regular season as well. Yeah. So, I mean, for us game content, I tried to, that strategy is nice as like a whole and you can have goals for it, but I really try to play it by ear, by game and by the feeling of everything that's actually happening in the game because social you want to be social in the moment but your your job is to like tell it kind of how it is and you're supposed to give updates mm -hmm. to some extent and if some, if nothing's happening you you 
you can't give an update in that way. And it's like, okay, well, how could you fill that? But is it relevant? And is it something good to post at that time? So yeah, for yeah. us, you know, sometimes that means it is a high volume of posts because there's just so much happening and so much going on that you can have that high volume. And, you know, then there's those games where we're getting completely blown out and you can have fun and kind of, you know, just it's baseball. It is what it is. So you can kind of have some fun with some of the content. You want to show off the good plays that do happen, but Honestly, if it doesn't feel right to post, I'm not just going to post to post. And yeah. yes, it's it's great to talk about players and plays, but maybe it's not the right moment. So it's it's okay to have a cool, you posted the lineup and then you posted the final score. And sometimes that is just how it's going to be. And again, when you have 162 games, I think it's a lot easier to have that strategy. Um, I don't think that that strategy can necessarily work in something like NFL. Um, your game coverage should be pretty similar, whether you're um, losing, winning at a game, because you only have that one game that week. You only get 17 Sundays. You only get so many of those. So you kind of have to like play it out. But then again, I'm also not someone who's sitting on the strategy of an NFL team right now. So I'm not going to sit here and judge them either. Maybe I'm the only person in the industry that hates that, but like, it's not my strategy to decide. Um, my goal is to focus on my team and what we do. Um, and so for us, it's, it's really just talking about the big moments that we can uh, in that season and then continuously evolving that voice, depending on what happens and the progress that we have as a team, the, the changes that we have in the players, the plays that we can. Um, and again, it's different also on every single platform too. Totally. I mean, I, 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 one of the many different directions we can go with a, a whole other podcast of, I, I, I always used to th consider as well, like, is this a game that a lot of people are watching or is, it, is this a, a uh, whatever, a 12 o'clock game on a Wednesday and you know, people might be following on Twitter because they can't watch or for, for yep. people. Um, then the home versus, then the uh, postseason versus regular season where you have everyone watching the postseason. Where regular season I will say season. home versus away, we always tried to make it the same. Mm -hmm. Um because at the end of the day, it's still a game. It's still an important game. Um, and again, it's you can't just decide like, oh, because it's a way that I just post less. We right. tried to always post in a similar fashion or some some of the similar things that we would do at home um, because it's who we are as a brand and it's who we are as a team. And we just try to be as consistent as possible. And that means us going on the road. It might mean a photographer going on the road, a videographer going on the road in order to create that consistency, because I don't want our timelines and, and what fans expect content wise to change just because we went to the Mets and we're in New York. And you're what, biggest now, I want there. to be similar. Yeah. You're and also from a, there. from a sponsorship perspective, there's so much that we do um, for sponsor content too, that we can't just stop because we're on the road right well aaron uh we're gonna hit up our extra inning segment the first episode's terrible stat coming right up awesome stuff from aaron hodges digital communications manager for the colorado rockies can really pick her brain all day she is super articulate and thoughtful and really gets this space in a lot of ways. But stick around because you're going to hear more from Aaron in our extra inning segment. Some really good stuff from that. So you're going to want to uh, not go anywhere. But first, this episode's shareable stat. And central shareable stat comes from a recent uh, look by eMarketer at Gen Z and, what, and specifically what social media platforms that they are active on and most active on of late. And the top three are not terribly uh, surprising if you pay attention to this stuff. Is Snapchat is number one by a decent margin followed by TikTok, followed by Instagram. So those are the top three uh, social media platforms uh, for Gen Z and expects to remain that way over the next few years. You know, Facebook, they also note in the study that Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and Reddit also have a decent number of Gen Z users, considerable, but not even really close to those top three, Snapchat, TikTok, and Instagram. And we forget about Snapchat, I think, too, too often in the space. Uh, obviously, it's primarily used for, for primary messaging, but they do a lot of cool stuff, of course, with AR. The Snap Map continues to develop as a product and is really compelling to me in particular. I really enjoy uh, checking out the Snap, Snap Map and what other people are doing. And, of course, the publisher side with uh, more and more brands continuing to sign on and you know, brands like ESPN continue to do good stuff on the Snapchat side. But one more thing they add to this um, is looking at the most frequently used apps. So that's looking at kind of the active users, but the most frequently uh, used apps is still Snapchat, 
still Instagram, still TikTok, but a fourth one among just the 18 to 25 year olds is Discord. So Discord, another one that's kind of a little bit forgotten sometimes along with Reddit where it's a lot more you know, dark social brands aren't quite in, invited to play quite as much on Discord, but a place to pay attention to, whether it's just for proactive listening, for learning, and potentially uh, get creative with ways that a brand can integrate itself in there. So lots of interesting stats. Uh, again, you can check it out on eMarketer, uh, looking at the social media, uh, social network usage by Gen Z. Uh, Snapchat, TikTok, and Instagram are the top three, uh, and, all, and the most frequently used Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, and Discord. All right, that's our social shareable stats. Stick around for more with Aaron Hodges, Digital Communications Manager for the Colorado Rockies. Right back from this episode's shareable stat, and I am joined once again on the podcast by Aaron Hodges. She is the Digital Communications Manager for the Colorado Rockies, the much-hated rival of the San Diego Padres, among other NL teams. But we will t- we, we won't rehash whether Matt Holiday ever touched home plate. That's a he touched. He touched. Oh no! Oh no! He touched. <laughs> inside, inside is joke for Rockies Padres fans. There. <laughs> um, all right, Aaron, you kicked ass in your interview. So so good. Uh, but are you now ready to try a little extra innings? All right, let's do this. Since we couldn't get a walk off, apparently. Ugh. Oh yeah. Well, ghost runner <laughs> or not, we, we still got to drive in a couple more. <laughs> Number one, um, you went to NYU. I, I remember looking at NYU when I was looking at schools and being like. It's like a school that's not, it's not really a campus almost like it's just in the city. So what was it like since I didn't get, to, I didn't go to NYU. What was it like going to NYU having that kind of campus within a city? So I really like that coming from Omaha, Nebraska, people thought I was crazy, like going to New York city and, and living there for five years. But I love the fact that it was very city. It allowed me to legitimately go integrate into the city so much easier because you're not like off campus. You're just there. So I could go do things super easy. I could go to sporting events. I could go to different restaurants or bars or whatever it might've been to be able to like actually experience the city. It wasn't great for sports. I will say that we had D three sports, um, but I did take advantage of those sports. It was fun to go to those games, D three, D one, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. They're still really fun to go to and, and support the athletes. Uh, I also became like a student athletic trainer. So that was super cool. Uh, but yeah, I love New York city. I miss it a lot. It's very different from Denver, but I love the fast pace. I love the hustle and bustle. And I love just being in the center of legitimately everything. And I think it, it made an impact in my career because there's so much in New York and there's so many companies and brands and teams yeah. and it just made it super easy to, to do what I wanted to do. Really cool. I really cool. That you really get to feel like you live in the city. Cause I, I looked at Columbia as well as there, but Columbia is kind of has a campus. You, you go and you go into campus and you're off, you're, you're not in the city, whereas in NYU you very much are. So yeah, our buildings were just like a part of other buildings they weren't nyu buildings they were just there in the middle of union square and then we had a park but it was a city park it wasn't nyu's park we just kind of took it over <laughs> i, so. I want to go to your time with bodybuilding.com um a brand that we had a, a we had a recent guest in the podcast from bodybuilding.com as well anthony just recently got there so they the brand continues to thrive uh to, even today but tell me looking back on your time with bodybuilding.com the most popular or most memorable social media post for you from your time at bodyfund.com. Yeah, I think it would be like anything that we did at expos. Um, that was our chance to connect one-on-one with fans, actually meet them, talk with them, get content from them, learn about their stories and, and their journeys in the fitness world, as well as connecting with our athletes. So that, that stuff usually performed the best because again, it's kind of like goes back to my point of like being the most relatable Yeah. Um, and very like that one-on-one type of content was really great and plus then you're also in new cities and you just get to do a lot when it came to expo so i think that those kind of posts always did the best it wasn't the salesy stuff by any means it's the oh. non-salesy stuff <laughs> i will say that the, the best part of going to the expos is, is all the free samples for me that's what i always enjoy. i know and i never got to take advantage of them <laughs> <laughs> uh, number three for Aaron, we talked a bit about tiktok in our interview um so if a sports team comes to you now and they're like what what should we do like what, what what's your top tiktok tip or tips uh for sports teams uh if my number one tip is have someone dedicated to it i think that it's to that point and it's big enough uh, and can make enough of an impact in your department and for your brand that if you have someone dedicated to just tiktok you will be so much more successful than if you're just kind of trying to do it on the side 
honestly, that probably goes for any platform, uh, but specifically TikTok, because you have to be so in, like in the trenches of the for you page, in the trends of the sounds, and you're not going to do that if you if you can't stay focused on it. Um, and then second is just like there's no failing on that platform. Like it might not pop off, it might not go viral, but you're never going to fail. Um, you're probably going to get better engagement than you would on a single video, even when your following is super low on TikTok, than you might on a very well developed Twitter account or Instagram account. So yeah, yeah there's no failing. Keep trying, keep creating content. And then, yeah, if you can and you have the resources, get someone dedicated to TikTok. I think it could really help. Love that. And definitely check out the Rockies TikTok. Uh, we'll we'll shout them out. Uh, <laughs> number four, um, besides the social platforms, the social media apps, which three mobile apps could you not live without for work purposes? What, what, what three apps on your phone do you, des- do you definitely need? For just work? Yeah. Okay. Um... One of them is Slate. It's like this design. It's like a newer app. Uh, basically, like you, you can input photos and templates and create different designs, and it's all on brand. You can import colors and fonts. Um, it was something new to MLB this year, mm-hmm. and I think it really, really helped us uh, create things at scale across multiple platforms and continuously keep it uh, branded content. Um, yeah, if if, if you can see helpful. like branded frames, oftentimes or fonts on Instagram stories. Yep. those are oftentimes being created in slate it's a it's a great platform yeah we also used it for just actual like instagram content with like our watermarks um yeah. the social sponsored stuff it made it super easy to get that out at at scale and at speed then always having to like go back to our computers and make something in premiere or yeah. just to put on a watermark for example or a logo all right so we got one you got two more got one uh two more uh tr- splice it's yeah. like a video editing app again love video editing it's super great it's fun you can do it on premiere but sometimes you need something super quick uh splice love that one good one and then oh gosh you know people a lot of people say slack honestly i hate slack with like a passion i won't use it i would much rather just text people probably ooh, probably my email app i know that that's super lame yeah. but i'm someone again because we're like in social there's so much i do on my phone that I just don't want to pull out my laptop and email is one of them. If I can just like quickly send an email and not have to open my laptop, it's super great. All right. And are you team inbox zero or team inbox like 20,000? Um, I'm team inbox in between. I, I right, will right. never have it at zero. I don't think that's even humanly possible, <laughs> but I'm certainly not at 20,000. That would right, like, right. cause me anxiety. Yeah. Those people freak me out. Now, I, I will say I created one of those cover things on my email so it doesn't have the little red bubble that says the number. Okay. So if I could have it at zero, that would probably be good because that's where I'm at is that I had to hide it. Uh, number five, Aaron, um, you, 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 you're active. You stay active. You talked about playing sports back in the day as well. And now you made the move to Colorado, which is notorious for people huffing and puffing. when They're like, did I just get out of shape? Uh, because the air is so because the elevation and all that the air is thin. So, so what was it like for you moving there and the first time maybe you, you started breathing hard? Yeah, it sucked. It straight up, it sucked. I never had issues with like trying to get adjusted to it by any means, but in terms of working out and fitness, yeah, it was really hard. It still is hard. Um, and I just had to just adjust my expectations on how long a workout was going to be, uh, especially when it comes to like cardio and to probably not run. Not that I was a big runner before, but now I certainly am not a runner. So I just took up different things, um, than like different cardio. So like I, I got back into rollerblading, weightlifting. I didn't really see a difference. Maybe I started lifting more. Apparently weight, I might weigh less and maybe I'm just faking my new PRs. Um, but yeah, it sucked and adapting. I mean, it was just finding new things and I'm still trying to learn, uh, how to not be crappy at athletics up here. So if anyone has tips, let a girl know. <laughs> hey, you'll, you'll just be, you'll just be in that much better uh, cardio shape when, when you, when you go to regular uh, altitudes. Well, see, see, then we would go on road trips and I would like use a hotel gym or something. And all of a sudden it was super easy. And I felt like freaking superwoman. Like I was crushing it. I was like, oh, right. I literally at sea level now. (laughs) (laughs) On number six, Aaron, uh, um, you talked about 
how even when you were not in sports, you were still involved, like part of the community and, and very much on top of things. And, and you, even you talk about the, the networking that you've done over the years. So just tell me about the relationships and value you get from the SM sports communities and social media communities. Yeah, I, I value relationships so much. And honestly, it's sometimes just more important than your actual skills. Um, and I'm not speaking from the point of like cool relationships, you're getting a job from them. Not from that standpoint, but just like actually making genuine relationships, friendships, they keep you going. Um, with the pandemic that happened, I don't even know if I would have been able to get through the pandemic without, you know, being able to have those virtual relationships, being able to get on Zoom happy hours when that was a thing. Um, they're, they're there, not just in SM sports, but social media as a whole, everyone understands the, the world that we live in and the stuff that we go through as social media professionals. Um, and so having that is, is super important for my mental health, uh, my mental state. Um, but then also like being able to, um, also have those professional relationships to, um, continuously get better, have mentors, uh, and at the end of the day, maybe down the road, be able to help you get, uh, get in the, get your foot in the door somewhere. Um, yeah, nice. it's always helpful in that way, but I always look at it from the perspective of these are my genuine friendships. And, and that is first and foremost important to me over anything that's transactional. Love that. Yeah. If you go into it, like thinking that I, Oh, I'm networking because of a goal I have, or just, or even just I'm networking, you know, you're, you're making relationships with people that you respect and maybe have something in common with. And yeah. like, that's what there's the ulterior motives should not be the, any primary motivating factor. If you have an ulterior motive, it's not a relationship anymore. Exactly. Yeah. I, to your point, like it should not be transactional. That's 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 yeah. the key operative term that you don't want to uh, think about all the time. <laughs> all right, number seven. This is kind of a, a, sim- a similar lines, but but just reflecting a little bit because you're you're good at this. Oh uh, man, I love our conversations about this kind of stuff. Uh, tell me the most important lessons personally and professionally that you've absorbed in your career so far. Um, probably number one is being willing to move. Uh, I moved a lot and having like, it, it's certainly not easy. And I know that not everybody can do it, uh, financially or even just being able to move somewhere. It, it's not simple, but in the sports world, your opportunities are likely not going to be in the city that you're currently in. They're going to be somewhere else. Um, and just, if you have that ability to move, uh, do it, have that openness. Cause one, you're going to be able to apply to more jobs. If you can say, yeah, I'll move to San Diego. Yeah. I'll move to Texas. I'll move to Florida. I'll move to Colorado. It all sucks. It's not fun to move, uh, but it's going to open your door. So uh, be willing to, to move whenever humanly possible. And then I think number two would be kind of like we, we talked about in the last point, um, making networking less transactional. Um, it's all about, being personable, it's all about being friendly. It's all about actually being a human. And it's not about what you get out of something at the end of the day. If anything, your relationship should be about what you can give to that person, um, not about what you get. So as soon as you you really take that to heart and you start building real relationships or friendships, I should say, um, I think your your network is going to grow and, and what you're able to do with those people. Um, and again, non-transactionally, what you're able to is just like a lot greater. So love that Make friendships, not just relationships. <laughs> love it. All right. Number eight, it's time for one of my favorite questions that are our, our, oh our podcast food question. Here uh, we go. Food. Now we're on a topic. I love, <laughs> I know. I know you talk about, you haven't had much chance to explore Denver yet. Um, but you, you spent, you spent lots of time in, in NYC to so tell me, um, the best meal to get in New York city and, and where to get it. Oh, that's simple. Okay. Uh, it's called Tom's diner. It's actually in Brooklyn. Um, I'm counting it. Uh, but they have like the best pancakes I've ever had in my life. I went on a, I'm going to find the best pancakes in New York city during one of the years that I was in college. And I decided on Tom's diner. So if you can get (laughs) over there, there's always a line to get there early, but it's well worth it. The inside it's it's legitimately if you think diner that's what it is but then throw in your grandma's house um nice yeah. christmas decorations all year round like it's that vibe it's fantastic and, and is it it's just, just straight buttermilk pancakes with syrup like what uh chocolate chip chocolate Ooh. chip for sure or blueberry take your pick you can go plain those are good too i just personally like toppings in, in mine just think it adds something to it and then, like, I can't talk about New York and not say something about bagels. 
So I'm going to throw in Tompkins Square Bagels. It's kind of in the Lower East Side. Mm. Uh, elite bagels in New York City. For sure. What's your What's your go-to bagel flavor? Cinnamon raisin. That's That's a good one. I do like my cinnamon. It's so freaking good, and like I can't find a bagel in New- in Denver that is even more anywhere close to New York. So I just like gave up. I was just like, it's not the same. These people don't understand bagels. Uh, I, I will say when he started talking about your quest to find the best pancakes, like for some reason in my head, I thought of like, okay, should there be a pancake crawl? Like there's a pub crawl? Like let's, let's, do, let's do a pancake crawl. Or, it-, <laughs> it was the best. It was the best. It was honestly the best year. I, I was so smart. Me and my friend, we just were like, every single Sunday, we're going to go try a new pancake place. And so we did. Oh, that sounds marvelous. <laughs> all right, number nine, Dre, we're coming toward the end here. Um, tell me the MLB player that we should be, all be following on social media and why. Ooh. Um, okay. I really love Francisco Lindor. I just think he's super fun. Yeah. Out there and outgoing. I love that he puts out his style stuff. He is super personable. Like, he just kind of puts off fun stuff. I think he could post a lot more. Hopefully he does in 2022. Uh, but yeah, he's a fun one. I also like Tucker Davidson, one of the pitchers for the Braves. Yeah. He's been really great on Twitter and TikTok lately. Maybe it's just because of postseason, but he's been super fun. I like those. I I, I, I definitely have I, the, both those have caught my eye when I especially when I've done some of the green fly studies as well of, of who's active on the I can't I have to also ooh, mm, I might hate myself for this, but I gotta throw in Bregman in there. Because he recently started his docu series, yeah. who I think Will Stout from LSU is filming right now, and it's fan, it's it's super cool to watch how that's all developing. Any player that's actually getting into their personal brand, like I will just just them. Any player that cares about social, yeah, yeah, yeah. He he's one of the he's one of the few that's really cultivated a bit of a YouTube presence. Uh, yes, a good job, which is underappreciated in, in the SM sports world by players. All right, last one for you, Aaron. When we're talking this time next year, which current Rockies player is going to be the breakout name that we should all be? We should. You're, you're going to give us the clue right now that we're all going to know his name next year. Uh, ooh. we have so many young guys. Um, I would probably say Ryan McMahon. He had an incredible year defensively. He's up for a Gold Glove this year. He was, or he's like a Gold Glove finalist. He's freaking fantastic. He started really strong offensively too. Um, and I just think he's, he's a young guy that is still getting even better. And if he was this good this year, I can only imagine the coming year. So I got to say Ryan Mac for sure. There we go. You heard it here first. Ryan McMahon. Pretend- if he disappoints me next year and I'm going to be sad. <laughs> just kidding. He's the best. <laughs> All right, Aaron, the winning run scored. You did it. You knocked him in. Um, now it's your chance to take over the podcast and tell us your social media all sort of follow. Just tell us who they are, what platform they're on, and why they were following. Ooh, like, so not myself? I get to talk about somebody else? We'll, 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 get, to, we'll get to you in a moment. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm, I don't want to talk about myself. Ooh, who's an all-star <laughs> follow? Um, somebody I really love on social and have for a really long time is Jess uh, at War Jess Eagle. Yeah. She used to do stuff with the Yankees. She did stuff with the New York Rangers. And now she's at Stuart yeah. Haas Racing, yeah. right? Uh, she's a really fun follow uh, for sports world content. So definitely uh, give her a follow. And then maybe somebody not in sports. Um, his name is Adam Ornelas. Uh, A-O, uh, at Adam Ray, I think, unless he changed it. Uh, he used to do like influencer marketing for Chipotle, but now he's with Coinbase. So tons of crypto, NFT does influencer marketing. I just think he's very interesting follow. He's, he has so much in his career, so it'll be exciting to see what he does in the, in this crypto NFT space. I like that. And how about you, Aaron? Where can we find you as well as all things Rockies across the digital and social webs? Yeah, so for me, love Twitter at Aaron Nicole H underscore, uh, as well as Instagram at Aaron underscore Hodges if you want my actual personal life and random photos of me. Um, and then obviously I'm on LinkedIn, always yep. happy to chat there, all things obviously professional related, and then definitely got to follow the Rockies. You don't really care about me. You care about the Rockies. So, uh, at Rockies across every single platform, we actually have it all the same. So it's super simple. Very <laughs>
Aaron, there's so much more we could have even touched on today. You're like, you are just full of great knowledge and insight, um, really thoughtful discussion. And I cannot thank you enough for coming on the podcast today. It's just as, as good as I could hope for, if not better. Oh, well, thank you. It was so much fun. And yeah, it was really long, but hopefully we brought some knowledge to the people. That, that's my goal. <laughs> I, look, I look forward to us hanging out in San Diego sometime soon. Yes, next season. Um, Rockies are going to win again. Uh, we'll we'll keep you. <laughs> thank you so much again to Aaron Hodges, digital communications manager for the Colorado Rockies. She is just a freaking rock star. I uh, really enjoyed talking to her and really appreciate the relationship that I have with her, which is not transactional, a genuine friendship, of course, as we talked about uh, in the interview. And really appreciate Erin uh, bringing some of her insight, her energy, her enthusiasm to the podcast today, and wishing her and the Rockies best of luck in the seasons to come. But that'll do it for this episode of the Digital and Social Media Sports Podcast. Thanks again for listening. As always, you can find me on Twitter at NJH287. Uh, hit me up on LinkedIn as well, Neil Horowitz, where I post more content. Visit the website, dsmsports.net, where you can find the full podcast archive and more content. And, of course, check out the podcast as well on any of your preferred podcast platforms. Until next time, this is Neil Horowitz signing off for the Digital and Social Media Sports Podcast.